Welcome to Free Thoughts, a podcast project of the Cato Institute's Libertarianism.org. Free Thoughts is a show about libertarianism and the ideas that influence it. I'm Aaron Powell, a research fellow here at Cato and editor of Libertarianism.org. And I'm Trevor Burris, a research fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies. Our topic for today's episode is Bitcoin. Joining us to discuss it is Timothy B. Lee, senior editor at Vox, covering technology and previously with The Washington Post. Tim, can you start by just telling us what is Bitcoin? Sure. So um, Bitcoin is fundamentally it's – a, it's a new payment technology. Um, so there's traditional payment technologies like uh, PayPal or Visa or MasterCard um, that lets you send money from one person to another, make payments. Um, and Bitcoin uh, is, a, is a network that um, performs the same function but it has a couple of important differences. Um, one of the differences is it's the first payment technology um, that's completely decentralized. So if you think about PayPal, there's a uh, – pay, you know, PayPal is owned by – eBay, but it's a company that runs the PayPal network that's responsible for ensuring that you know if you get a, a payment in PayPal that you'll be able to actually get your money out. Um, there's no Bitcoin Incorporated that runs the Bitcoin network. It's a, operated as a peer-to-peer network. There's um, thousands of computers around the world that um, collectively sort of manage the um, the network according to some standardized rules, um, and that means there's also nobody in control of it, and it means that there's no gatekeepers. So um, anybody can um, create new Bitcoin-based applications. Anybody can send money through it. There's no um, there's no regulations about you know what kind of transactions you can have and so forth. Um, the second thing that's unique about the Bitcoin network is that um, whereas PayPal and Mastercard use the dollar as their unit of account, um, Bitcoin has its own currency, which is slightly confusingly also called the Bitcoin, um, and that's a currency that um, isn't Tag, pegged to any conventional currency. Um, it doesn't have any fixed value in terms of dollars or euros. Um, rather, it floats just as the euro and the dollar float against each other and have different values over time. Um, so Bitcoin, the currency, um, the value it floats against the dollar. This sounds sort of bizarre. I mean, if we think about money, this this doesn't sound like anything we've ever heard of. Something similar before. It's it, you can't get one in paper, right? You can, or, or a coin, an actual coin. Uh, so computers just churn this out, and and people use them to buy things. That seems a little bit weird. Yeah, it's 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 very weird. I mean, it was it's very counterintuitive. When I first heard about Bitcoin in 2011, I was pretty skeptical of it. Um, and uh, it's it's you know, so partly I think it's just historical. Um, conventional currencies they started out, um, you know, often they were uh, backed by gold or something like that, and then they transitioned to um, to what's called fiat currencies that isn't backed to anything. Um, but we're still, you know, pieces of paper, as you were saying. We got checking accounts. We have this pretty complicated um, sort of infrastructure that's very intertwined with the banking system and with the regulation and so forth. Um, I, I think actually, though, if if you look at the way things work right now, in many ways the conventional banking system is mostly electronic, and we still we still exchange pieces of paper, but the really big payments are all electronic. We use more and more things like with credit cards. Um, so in some ways, Bitcoin is it's it's the first kind of purely electronic payment technology. Um, but the idea of making payments electronically is not super new or unusual. I Maybe we can walk through because it still I think is a little bit confusing of what this thing actually looks like and from, where from they the come user from. perspective <laughs> and just in general. So where do these – there's these things called bitcoins that mm. – you know, so if I pay you with them, I'm paying you with something and right. those don't exist except in computers. They're just right. code somewhere. So where do they come from? How do I get them? And what happens when we exchange them? Sure. So um, the way the, the the fundamental kind of unit of the Bitcoin network is there's this thing called the blockchain, which is just a list of transactions that have happened. Um, and one of the unusual things about the Bitcoin network is that every um, every computer that participates as a kind of a full member of the Bitcoin network. Um, has a list of every transaction that's ever happened in the Bitcoin network since the beginning of the network in 2009. Um, and the way it works is kind of by consensus. So um, if you have a Bitcoin and you want to send it to me, you submit a transaction that just says, you know, this address pays this address and there's some cryptography that goes into that to make sure it's um, secure. And then that's just distributed to everybody else who's on the Bitcoin network through a particular um, set of protocols that ensure that there's some some security and some consistency. And you once mean, what you mean the record of the transaction is distributed to everyone else on the yes, network? exactly okay. everyone who has the program. <laughs> everybody who has the program. So I could I could be on the network if I installed this program mm-hmm. on my computer. Yes, um, yeah. So you can run your computer. It's it's actually it's become because there's the volume of transactions is growing to the point where it's difficult for somebody on a home PC to sort of keep up with the volume of transactions, but certainly. In principle, you could. You might, you know, 
in a few years, you might have to get like a pretty beefy server to do this. But yes, anybody can just join, be kind of a full member of that network, and can get can download this record of every transaction that ever happened. Um, and so when you make a payment, you simply announce this to the rest of the network. Once there's kind of a consensus of the network that, yes, this transaction occurred, then the Bitcoins that you formerly owned now officially belong to me. Um, and there's no um, – in terms of what they are, how you store them, um, there's uh, just a uh, – there's like a, a private key, which is like a password that gives you the ability to transfer the Bitcoins. Um, and you just store that on your hard drive or you can write it down on a piece of paper or um, there's – you know, it's just a little piece of information that gives you the ability to control those bitcoins, and that's all there is to it. It's just it's it's a record in this shared address and a private key that gives you the ability to transfer it. So why are they valuable? So that is a very interesting question. I mean, and so in some ways, you can ask the same question about conventional currencies, right? I mean, the the reason that Bitcoin is valuable, the reason dollars are valuable, is because people have an expectation that other people will accept them in exchange for goods and services. Um, and you know that's a very familiar notion for the dollar. Like obviously, little green pieces of paper are not intrinsically valuable, but um, you know we have this convention that um, has existed for many decades that that's true. Um, but it, it is an interesting question: How do you bootstrap this process? And um, basically, it, it just was a gradual process with Bitcoin. Um, if you go back to 2010 when Bitcoin was young, you could buy um, 10,000 Bitcoins for about fifty dollars. Um, there was a pizza that was purchased for uh, 10,000 bitcoins. And now it's worth um, about – Right. And so at that point, that was less than a penny. Now a bitcoin is worth about $600. So, so that's expensive pizza. Yeah. So that pizza you know, would have cost you $6 million or something like that. I mean if, if you'd save those bitcoins, the, the, pe- the guy that bought the pizza, that was not a good financial transaction. Um, and it was just – I think to a large extent, it's just um, kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy where people, they see that there's this interesting new payment network that they think might be valuable in the future. Um, and they see that if it is valuable in the future, these individual bitcoins will have to be valuable in order to accommodate all the transactions people want. And so they make kind of a speculative bet that if I buy now, it will be valuable later. And then every, as everybody does that, it sort of becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy where the prediction that it will be valuable actually becomes valuable. Where do these bitcoins come from? So we've got this ledger. So if I understand mm-hmm. it correctly, like I don't actually have – if I own bitcoins um, – I don't actually have bitcoins themselves anywhere. Rather, I have a an address, a pass code of some kind, and then mm-hmm. there's this ledger that exists out there that that says I have right. ten bitcoins. Or right. Whatever you say it is. this address has ten bitcoins, right. and you have the password. Right. So, but know. all I have in my possession is this address. Right. Um, so where do those? What's to stop me from entering into that ledger? You know, I'm transferring you a thousand bitcoins that mm-hmm. I didn't have. Is there some? Yeah. So so the. The um, so two things. Uh, the way the ledger works is that anytime there's a Bitcoin transaction, um, it, the the network every node checks to make sure that the the from address actually had the number of Bitcoins and it debits that amount. So that's why you couldn't just say I get ten thousand. Now the question obviously is where do they come from? I um, mean, this is one of the really clever things about the way Bitcoin is designed. So um, the process of clearing transactions of um, receiving all these announcements of transactions and making sure they're consistent and distributing some other nodes, you know, that costs that takes some some work, some you know take some effort. And so the way the Bitcoin network is, is organized, everybody who um, participates in the network has what amounts to a lottery. There, there's a difficult mathematical problem that everybody tries to solve and the first computer to solve it um, gets to uh, – add a new block of transactions to this thing called the blockchain. And as a reward for that, they get to award themselves a fixed number of, block of bitcoins, which right now is 25 bitcoins. Um, and so this is this kind of clever um, incentive mechanism where um, – it's, it's, like I said, it's kind of like a lottery where if you participate in this process that benefits the Bitcoin network, um, every once in a while you'll win the lottery and get 25 bitcoins, which is worth um, like $15,000. So it's a significant um, amount of money. And so those bitcoins then just show up as again an entry on this ledger saying yes. this address that happened to win the lottery here has them. Yes. Um, then does this mean so one of the things that you hear about is people losing bitcoins. I remember mm-hmm. hearing a story recently about some guy who said that he had a hard drive that he had mined bitcoins to and yeah. then he threw it out or he lost it or something and so those bitcoins were lost. But if I'm understanding you correctly, they're not really lost. Those bitcoins still exist in the ledger. It's mm-hmm. just that he can't, his, access he can't them. access them and no one else can because they don't have whatever code was sitting right. on that hard drive. Right. There's a private key or kind of a password that you need to access those bitcoins and there's no like password recovery mechanism. Right. If you lose the password, then in theory, those bitcoins still exist and 
you know, if somebody happened to guess what the password is, they'd be able to use them. But it's very difficult to do that. And so in practice, nobody's ever going to be able to do anything with those particular Bitcoins again. So these computers, they're incentivizing them to mine. I think it's called mining, right? That's they, right. They mine the Bitcoins to produce more by solving these problems. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking of like Fermat's last theorem or something like that. Maybe something less less no, difficult a, than that. So it's a very it's actually a very repetitive um the problem that's being solved is just a very repetitive one. There's a function called a hash function mm-hmm. that um just produces a random string and they just do this computation over and over again with a different um sort of input value until they get a very low number as the output. Um and so it's not it's not actually like an interesting mathematical problem. It's just they need some way of um kind of calibrating the um, you know as more people join the network, they need some way of calibrating it so you don't have too many people getting these rewards. And so this is just a way of um, by setting how low of a number you have to get. It's a way of ensuring that you get um, these rewards get distributed at so, a so standard rate. The uh, the next thing. So this actually creates more computers on the network, though, which would mm-hmm. seem to help yes. the network, right? right. In exactly. terms of how how many transactions you can make on it and how yes. useful it is. Right? right. So one of the advantages of this is that given that it takes a huge amount of computing power now to um, to what's called solve a block and get this reward, um, it means that if some hostile person wanted to kind of take over the network and you know destroy it or you know add bogus transactions or something, they would need a huge amount of computing power in order to do that. Um, and so it makes the system more robust and more secure. And there's – as I understand, there's a cap to the number of bitcoins that can ever be mined, right? This doesn't – the mining doesn't go on and on forever. Yeah. So um, what, what it does is, is that the, the amount of bitcoins uh, falls by half every four years. And so if you do your sort of power series – The amount you get for winning yeah, the lottery. Yeah, the amount you get every 10 minutes on average for, for winning this lottery. Right now it's 25 bitcoins. It will be 12 and a half bitcoins starting in about 2017 and six and a quarter, et cetera. And if you just sort of add up all those numbers, you'll – asymptotically approach 21 million as the, the long-term number. Then one thing I wonder about was if – so Bitcoins is – so they can't – the Bitcoins themselves can't be lost but the address mm-hmm. that they are attached to can be lost such that those Bitcoins are now kind of out of circulation right. effectively and can't really be brought back into circulation. Right. So if Bitcoins can be lost but there's a cap at you know, the maximum number. Mm-hmm. Then does that end up meaning that Bitcoin at some point is kind of necessarily deflationary because Bitcoins, you know, like like we all – cash gets lost. It gets you right. know, lost in the washing but machine or whatever. But it yeah. gets replaced. Yes. But it doesn't sound like these can be replaced. So That's right. it will def- – Deflate. Yeah, I, I think it's reasonable to expect. And, you know, not only that, but you know, economies grow over time, and so you, you probably, in an ideal world, you want the, the supply to be expanding if if your goal is have stable prices. So yes, I think it's reasonable to expect that the value of a bitcoin, you know, it's gone up very quickly in the past. I think that'll probably slow down eventually. But yes, I think over time you should expect the value of a bitcoin to go up over time. Are there mechanisms? So that this is a distributed network, and mm-hmm. it's, is this open source? Mm-hmm. Um, then, if if that was at some point in the future enough people decided that was a serious problem and mm-hmm. they wanted to fix that in the code. Right. Is there a way that can be done in this system that Bitcoin can be modified? Sure. I mean so it's you know like any kind of social system, if everybody agreed to change the rules, the rules could be changed. Um, but it's um, – you know, I, mean, so I actually think there's kind of an analogy to the US constitution, right? I mean the constitution came into existence because a bunch of a bunch of guys said we think this is better than the system we had before. In principle, if a critical mass of Americans decided we don't like the constitution, we like some other system, they could change that. Um, there's nothing in the Bitcoin uh, system analogous to kind of the amendment process where you can um, sort of propose changes. Um, but if a critical mass of people on the network um, decided to accept a new version of the software that um, say issued currency at a faster rate than currently, um, then that new network could become – come to be seen as the, the real Bitcoin network. Um, I think that's not very likely to happen because, um, of course, the people that uh, you'd have to persuade are, are largely people who have a lot of Bitcoins themselves. And the precedent of saying, oh, we're going to start increasing the, the supply of Bitcoins more quickly would be not in their financial interest. So I, I think the expectation there will never be 21 million – more than 21 million Bitcoins is probably a pretty good bet that that will actually be true. But yeah, it's certainly possible that it could change. When will that happen based on the current – Well, so it's, it's a gradual thing. So um, about half of them have in mind um, and then you'll get halfway to 20, 21 million every four years. So you'll get about three quarters by about um, 2016 I think and then to – Seven eighths by you know, but it'll continue for it's more, asymptotic. Is asymptotic is yeah. the is the yeah. technical term, but it'll continue for like a century. Okay, um, mm-hmm. of 
very, very small amounts of So at some point you might get 0.2 Bitcoins exactly. from, yeah. from solving the same. Yeah, and it will get closer and closer to 21 million but never quite reach it. Interesting. So give a little bit of history. Where did this come from? Uh, if we have, I know this has been talked about recently about right. who created the code. And, yeah, so, but, so we don't know for sure who, like who the person was. The, somebody calling himself Satoshi Nakamoto um, released a paper in 2008 describing the system and then released the first version of the software in 2009. Was it a, a peer-reviewed paper or just an online paper or? It was just a paper. I don't think it was peer-reviewed. He posted it to a cryptography mailing list that was interested in these kinds of issues of cryptocurrencies and peer-to-peer systems. Um, and for the first couple of years, he actively led development of the project. He controlled sort of what changes were made to the open source software and he um, kind of cultivated a community. Um, there was a programmer, one of the early people who kind of came into the community and offered to start helping was this guy named Gavin Andresen who's a you know, computer programmer. Um, in 2011 or maybe late 2010, um, Satoshi put uh, Andreessen's name on the Bitcoin mailing list and, or on the, the website as kind of the owner and basically stopped contributing. And ever since then, um, Gavin Andreessen has been the lead developer and um, Satoshi Nakamoto, with one exception, has not been heard from since 2011. And that exception was re- recently. Here. Yeah, so the one exception. So people have been speculating who is either – various people have been named as, as possible candidates. It's not you, um, is it? <laughs> I'm not Satoshi Nakamoto. I can confirm that. Um, so yeah, so a few weeks ago, uh, Newsweek magazine found a Japanese guy whose name is actually Satoshi Nakamoto. Uh, or actually, he used to be Satoshi Nakamoto. He changed his name to Dorian Nakamoto. But anyway, he um, – Newsweek identified him as the real Satoshi Nakamoto that created Bitcoin. He has denied it and the real Satoshi Nakamoto, we believe, posted on one of the accounts that had previously been associated with him saying he was not Dorian Nakamoto. Um, anyway, so that's that's the guy who created it. But today there is a, a large community of um, you know volunteers in the open source project. Um, and as with any open source project, a lot of the work is done by um, commercial companies that use Bitcoin. So there's a number of Bitcoin startups that have venture capital funding. And so a lot of the um, source code, a lot of the contributions to the software is made by these companies that rely on it. Is this the first cryptocurrency? Um, and if it's not, why – what about this one? Because this seems to be a pretty big deal in a way that I don't remember yeah, hearing about other alternative it's, it's currencies. The first, it's the first cryptocurrency of this type certainly. So the, the key thing that no one had previously figured out is you have this thing called the double spending problem. So let's say that the basic idea of eCash is very simple. You've got um, – You've got a, a private key that describes some coins, and you can give them to you can. There's an easy way to mathematically say, you know, transfer these coins to me. The question, though, is you still have your coin. The question is, how do we make sure that you didn't also write the same t- transaction to, to Trevor? And the only way previously that was known to do that is to have a central authority um, that just keeps a, that keeps that ledger themselves. And if you try to send transactions to both of us, they say, no, no, you couldn't do that. We're only going to recognize one of them. Um, the question is, how do you do that in a decentralized fashion? And so this process we were talking about before with the mining and the shared ledger and all that sort of thing, um, there's some very clever technical aspects to how you actually make that work. And Bitcoin is the first system that actually got that to work. Um, and I think the reason that's really important is that if you have a centralized authority, if you have a PayPal incorporated and there were a number of um, digital currencies in the 90s that had a company, a startup that was behind them, um, that startup becomes a kind of focus of control. It becomes a focus for regulation and it also becomes something – if I'm thinking about building something on top of um, you know, beans or flues, which are a couple of the currencies in the past, I have to worry, is this company going to be around in five years? Is this company going to jack up their fees in the future? Um, and so that becomes kind of a single point of failure for this network, for this currency. Um, whereas with Bitcoin, since nobody owns it, um, there's nobody to, to the, for regulators to uh, you know impose regulations on. There's nobody to sort of you know erect toll gates and say you know you can't do this. Um, and so it's a much more open technology. Okay, that that's very fascinating because it seems this very bottom up Hayekian type of thing where you actually have this thing grow without any point of central control. Right. But I think a lot of people would say, well, that's exactly the problem. They think of money as something that requires central control mm-hmm. and something that that you need to. Find that person so you can hold them responsible. We need to know where Satoshi Nakamoto is so we can hold him responsible if if he breaks the law. But there's no one to hold responsible. So is this something you can trust? And, and actually, I think for your personal experience, because I think you said that you didn't trust Bitcoin originally, mm-hmm. or you were you were pretty skeptical about it, and now maybe you were less skeptical. So can you describe why you changed your mind and why maybe people can be less skeptical than they might be about it? Yeah. So I mean, I, th- I think that there's different senses of trust, right? So um, 
having confidence that Bitcoin is a useful payment technology doesn't depend on trusting in any specific um, institution or person the way it does with like PayPal or something like that. Um, if people choose to trust in Bitcoin, it's because they have examined the source code, they've studied how the protocol works, or the, you know they've talked to experts who've done that, and they've convinced themselves that the set of kind of processes that um, make Bitcoin work are reliable, that they won't easily be broken, um, and so forth. Um, and so I think it just took time for people to um, examine that. And this isn't that unusual. If you think about other open source projects, you know people build billion dollar businesses on top of Linux. Um, on top of Apache, there's these um, kind of core infrastructure of the internet, and the internet itself, in some ways, is an open technology where nobody owns the TCP/IP protocols that make the internet the internet. Um, but people uh, and people were skeptical of those of those technologies initially. But over time, as people use them, as they continue to be reliable, as they grew, um, people were like, "Okay, this works. Um, this has various advantages over a you know, more closed system," and so it became kind of the foundation of a lot of important technology. But we've been hearing all of these high-profile hacking cases, mm -hmm. right? With this, so Mt. Gox, which was a big Bitcoin exchange, right? Either went down or was hacked. I don't mm -hmm. quite know, but but Both. there have been these instances, and people are losing all of these bitcoins. Yes. And so, is that is that a problem unique to how Bitcoin is set up? Is there a way to address it? And also, how does that fit in? What are these exchanges doing? If going back to this ledger, you know, am I storing? Is that how Mt. Gox works? Like I'm storing that my wallet code there and then it gets lost or – Yeah, so I think it's important to distinguish between the core Bitcoin protocol, core Bitcoin network, um, which is a, a pure peer-to-peer -peer network that nobody controls. And then there's lots of individual institutions that provide services kind of on top of that um, – on top of that basic network. So in the case of Mt. Gox, what they actually did was you would simply transfer the Bitcoins to them and then they would act kind of like a bank where they would have an account on their own computers saying Aaron has 10 Bitcoins. Um, but that part wasn't really in the Bitcoin system. That was just a separate computer system. That computer system was insecure. People thought, oh, I have 10 Bitcoins because I have this account with Mt. Gox. Um, and so you know, one of the things that's different about Bitcoin right now compared with, say, the dollar is that um, – Bitcoin institutions traditionally have not been regulated the way to traditional banks have. And so you don't have a deposit insurance. You don't have the rigorous auditing. Now, arguably, maybe those things should exist. I mean, if you're – certainly at a minimum, if you're holding um, other people's wealth, you know, there's certain basic um, due diligence that you ought to be expected to do that Mt. Gox clearly did not do probably. You know, I, may, I think they, um, you know, they, they should have done a better job of that. Um, but that does not – you know, just just as a an insolvent bank doesn't mean the dollar is not a reliable currency. The fact that some Bitcoin institutions are un, unreliable um, doesn't, I think, really fundamentally reflect on the reliability of the Bitcoin network. Um, now, I think it is important, on the other hand, to say that if you are an ordinary consumer, um, it is relatively difficult to save Bitcoin securely, um, and it's probably not a good idea if you have you know have a significant amount of wealth. You wouldn't want to put them in a Bitcoin wallet and store them on your hard drive because your hard drive could crash, your, um, your, your computer could get hacked, other you know, kinds of problems could come up. And so I think in the long run, we are going to need Bitcoin institutions that perform the same kind of role that banks do in the conventional banking system um, that maybe are more regulated or may not be, um, but that people over time earn people's trust and then provide people with some of the same um, assurances. So ordinary consumers, I think, should expect that if they put one Bitcoin in some institution, they have a high degree of confidence that um, it won't be stolen, that if their computer gets hacked, that maybe that company will make them whole, etc. Um, but that's individual institutions as opposed to the underlying Bitcoin network. That, that's fascinating because in the history of, of money in the in the regular money, I guess I would call it, not cryptocurrencies, that was of course how – uh, some of the first paper money emerged because you would store your gold in some place that you had confidence mm -hmm. they would keep your gold. And so right. the confidence is a huge part of that. And then they would give you a slip to you, so you could go get your gold, but then you started trading that slip amongst people. That's and of right. course, it was confidence in the person holding your gold mm -hmm. that made it transferable in the first place. If you think it might be stolen, then it's not going to be transferable. So, which brings my question about this seems like kind of like a gold standard type of thing. If there's a hard limit on how much you can actually, how many bitcoins can actually exist, there will be asymptotically, mm -hmm. then it's sort of controlled from inflation. And it's the kind of thing that, that possibly is better than a gold standard or similar to a gold standard. Standard or something that can control currency. So, uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. So, so one of the things I think is important to um, 
to say about about Bitcoin at least now, and I think this may continue to be true in the future, is nobody really prices things in Bitcoin. So um, certainly, there are you can at any given time. If you know, if I want to spend a hundred dollars, that's you know two tenths of a Bitcoin or something like that. So you can make those conversions, but but you don't have like electronic stores that say you know the stereo is three bitcoins, right? What what they do is they say this stereo is five hundred dollars, and then at the at the point of sale. They convert that to the equivalent time of, amount of bitcoins when you want to make your purchase. Um, even the Bitcoin Foundation, which is a nonprofit that um, sort of advocates for Bitcoin, um, they pay their employees in Bitcoin, but the salaries are not set in Bitcoin. You don't get five bitcoins a month; you get you know fifty thousand dollars, and then right. So um, one of the consequences I think of that I think is that um, inflation is does not have the same kind of concern or deflation um, does not I think may not create the same kinds of problems you see with conventional currencies because a lot of the problems you see with um, with inflation and deflation in conventional currencies is because people's salaries, their mortgages, um, other you know their, their rent, other kind of long term contracts uh, contracts are made in dollars, and so it can be very disruptive if the dollar becomes worth twice as much or half as much as it was a year ago. Um, that sort of throws a lot of long term economic relationships out of whack. Um, whereas if everybody is still using conventional currencies to set their prices. You know, nobody would it would be crazy to take out a mortgage in Bitcoin, so people do that in dollars. Um, fluctuations in the value of Bitcoin doesn't, I think, doesn't create the same kind of economic dislocations that fluctuations in, say, the value of the dollar would. So we've covered so far how this thing works, why, or why it works, but mm-hmm. I want to turn now to like why we might want to use it, what mm-hmm. advantages it has, why it seems so exciting, and I want to start with the the one that a lot of people seem to point to, um, which is anonymity. Mm-hmm. Right, like so. A lot of the stories originally around Bitcoin were it was being used to buy and sell all sorts of illegal things online because you couldn't be traced. Um, but I guess from what you told us earlier about the way this ledger works, it's not quite entirely anonymous, right? Because right. A, a ledger of every transaction is open for anyone to look at at any time. That's right. So it's definitely um, more traceable than than paper money is. If if I Take a bunch of hundred dollar bills and give them to a drug dealer. Um, it's going to be very hard for the authorities, unless they had previously kind of marked the bills. It's going to be very hard for them to track that transaction. Whereas if I go online to you know an online drug market and do that, um, they will be able to see these these sequence of transactions that led up to that money going to that person. And depending on how I got the bitcoins, they might be able to tie it to my identity. Um, what Bitcoin doesn't have is it doesn't have a network uh, a mechanism. Um, like traditional banks have, um, traditional banks have this what's called know your customer regulations, where um, anytime you open a bank account, you have to t- give them you know, like your real identity and your social security number and so forth. The core Bitcoin protocol doesn't have anything like that. The, these Bitcoin addresses are just strings of numbers, um, and you can have as many as you want. So you can use you know one address for kind of legitimate transactions, and if you're then gambling, you know you can use a different address for that. Um, and so by default, there's no way to tie addresses to people. Um, on the other hand, though, I think that in the long run, what's going to happen is that um, regulatory authorities are going to insist that um, any institution that provides um, conversions between Bitcoins and conventional currencies um, do the same kind of know your customer uh, processes that um, other, any other kind of financial institution does. And so in, in practice, I think it will not be easy to use Bitcoin in an anonymous way because if you go to a conventional exchange and you buy 10 Bitcoins and you use it to buy uh, some cocaine, um, the authorities will be able to, to subpoena the, the institution that helped you buy your Bitcoins and say, you know, what a, what real world identity is associated with these Bitcoin addresses. Um, now, there probably will still be people who are really determined to maintain their an- anonymity. They can do things like find somebody on the street and give them $100 in cash and get you know a Bitcoin from, from them that way and that will still be difficult to track. But it will be a hassle in much the same way that like dealing with large amounts of cash is a hassle. Um, there will be ways to stay under the radar but for most people, it won't be really practical. This, so this would be like a money laundering type of thing where mm-hmm. – where, and that I think is something that the, the SEC has already come out with a, a rule about that or a proposed rule, one of the first regulations or what? Well, so there's, a, there's an agency called the um, FinCEN, the Financial Crimes oh, okay. Enforcement Network that um, enforces the nation's money laundering rules and they have said that um, – so the, the term of art here is money transmitter. They have said that Bitcoin exchanges, which are the companies that let you buy and sell Bitcoins with other Bitcoin users, that they are um, subject to these rules and that they need to collect identifying information about their customers. Um, but ordinary Bitcoin users are not considered money transmitters. And so if you're just buying and selling, you don't have to um, 
you know, say if you send money to somebody, you don't have to figure out what their real world identity is before you make the transaction. And you know, I think that's probably a reasonable interpretation of the law. So what's good about all this? I mean, what what does Bitcoin offer us? Assuming it was widely used, or mm. you know, we let it mature more, more people are um, feel secure about it. Like, what what's it going to give us that our current system of cash and credit cards and banks and all that doesn't. So I think the, the way to think about this is to think about the early internet. Um, so if you go back to say 1984, um, there was a network called the internet. It was very small. It was frankly not very useful. I mean you had email but you didn't have any of the other sort of modern services you expect. Um, it was very complicated to use and it crashed a lot and so forth. Um, th- but the thing that was really good about the internet was it was an open technology. So then in 1990, a guy named Tim Berners-Lee created the World Wide Web, which was this very useful new platform for creating websites. And then companies like Google and Facebook created new services on top of that. And the thing that made the internet a better platform for that kind of thing than AOL or CompuServe or any of the other online services was that it was this open platform where there was no bureaucracy. There was no um, company saying, oh, that's not consistent with our business model or you have to pay this amount of money to, to do this. It was just an, kind of a wide open free for all where anybody could, could sort of build on top of this platform. Um, I think Bitcoin is in a similar situation relative to conventional credit cards. So if you want to be a credit card merchant, you want to accept um, credit card payments, there's a book that's literally hundreds of pages long that specifies all the procedures you have to go through and all the rules you have to follow and all the fees you have to pay in order to be a a credit card merchant. And there are lots of types of um, financial transactions or um, financial services that you just can't provide without going through a, a long discussion with the credit card bureaucracy and all these big banks to get permission to do this. Um, where in, whereas in contrast, there's no n- nothing like that in Bitcoin. You can just uh, – you know, Bitcoin service is just code. You can just – on a weekend, you can whip up you know, a, a service that does whatever you want. And so I think that what we're likely to see in the future is not that people will use the kind of raw um, Bitcoin network in the sense that they'll actually have Bitcoins on their hard drive and they're sending Bitcoins to their friends. What we'll see is that we'll have companies that use the basic um, facilities provided by Bitcoin to build more sophisticated um, services that uh, allow people to do many of the things that the conventional financial network does but better or cheaper. So a couple of specific examples. One, one that I've always pointed to is um, – is uh, international uh, money transfer. So if you think about a company like Western Union, um, they charge anywhere from 5 to 8 percent of um, the amount you're sending to send the money. And um, I think that if, if you pay the higher rate, it maybe takes a few hours. If you pay a lower rate, it can take up to three days. Um, Bitcoin transactions, uh, the core network has very, very low fees and a transaction takes 10 to 30 minutes to, to, to process. Um, now, obviously, you have to get bitcoins in. You have to get your dollars into bitcoins, and then your bitcoins into whatever the currency you're sending to. So it's the, the low fees on the Bitcoin network by itself um, doesn't get you a, a viable way, alternative. Yeah. But it's it's still eight percent gives you a lot of headroom. You can imagine lots of Bitcoin based startups. Um, so there there are Bitcoin ATMs now that charge I think two to three percent, and you would expect those prices to go down over time. So that's one case where um, just as the internet disrupted, you know, an application like Skype disrupted the conventional phone system, you could expect a, a, a new generation of Bitcoin-based uh, Western Union competitors disrupting Western Union. So this seems less like a currency now, which is the way we always often seem to talk about it, or at least libertarians, mm-hmm. than a, a payment system. That's right. And, and I think – so, so the, the reason it, it is also a currency is that um, the reason that a dollar in PayPal is worth a dollar is that the PayPal company stands ready anytime you want to take your PayPal units out to give you the dollars that you've been promised. Um, it's hard to see how you could have a decentralized network with that property because you'll have units of currency inside the network, but there's nobody to guarantee that you'll get a dollar or a euro or whatever out. So I think that the, in some ways the currency is a necessary evil of having this open network um, because in order to have something with no owner, you have to have have it float against conventional currencies. Um, and the good thing is that um, people are willing to kind of make that leap of faith to say even though this is completely made up, we have confidence that it's such a useful network that we're willing to treat it as though it has value. And once a critical mass of people are willing to make that leap of faith, it actually does have value. Well, your point about about 
there being – dollars being the same thing mm -hmm. I think is well taken because uh, that there's an Onion article from a, a year ago or so that said that you know US economy collapses as everyone realizes that dollars aren't worth anything. <laughs> right. Just, so we all just trust each other and so it's really building on the same thing that right. dollars themselves build off of. But what about the libertarians who say, oh, this is going to uh, – take over from the dollar or the euro. When the dollar is inflated to minuscule amounts and your bank account is empty, mm -hmm. people will tr go into bitcoins and, right. and where they are protected from those forces. So, I, mean, I, th I think it's conceivable that in the very long run in 50 or 100 years that you could have a financial system that's based on bitcoin somehow. Um, but certainly in the, the short to medium term, um, I don't think it, th that argument makes very much sense, frankly. I mean partly because if you look at the volatility of bitcoin, so OK, so the dollar loses 2 or 3 percent of its value per year. Um, there have been days when Bitcoin has lost 10, 20, 30 percent of its value. So if what you're worried about is maintaining the value of your currency, um, Bitcoin is just not a good choice. Um, and obviously on the average, you gain a little bit of money. But the other thing is you don't you – know, the money in your pocket, you're not holding for years. You get, you, know, you get paid on Friday and the next Tuesday you're spending it again. You don't really care if a fraction of a percent of, of value. Um, so I think the value of – Bitcoin as a hedge against inflation is probably overstated. There are better ways to do that. Um, it's certainly not – you know, it's, it's one benefit of holding Bitcoin. But I think the primary way is that it's a, a better way to make payments and, and could enable a lot of innovation. How many of these advantages <clears throat> that you've outlined for Bitcoin – you talked about the huge book of rules you have to follow for processing credit cards and all that. Like, mm -hmm. How many of those are, are a result of government not having gotten involved really in this at all? So far, so there aren't many regulations, and presumably, if Bitcoin gets big enough, because it's still—I mean, even though Bitcoins, individual Bitcoins, are worth a lot of money to you and me, in all told, they're not. We're not talking huge amounts of numbers by right. global economic standards. But when they get, if it gets big enough, wouldn't the governments just kind of step in and say, "Wait, we got to start regulating this in all of these ways," and then those advantages? Then we have a big stack of rules we have to follow for processing Bitcoin. Yeah, so I think it's it's a couple of things. Um, so one of the reasons that you have so many rules in um, the uh, credit card system and, and other networks like PayPal, I think, are similar, is that the conventional financial system um, is what's called reversible. So um, if the, the way the credit card network works is, you know, you go to a restaurant, you hand the the waiter your um, credit card, and it's basically on the honor system. They can type in any number they want, and if later you then see, oh, this number was not what I authorized, you have to dispute it and then the money goes back to the credit card company. It goes back to you through the credit card company. And um, to make that system work requires this large bureaucracy, requires um, a lot of rules governing when you can dispute things and who has to pay what back. Um, Bitcoin uh, has a different approach which is that uh, transactions are irre irreversible. So you give me your one Bitcoin, um, there's no no authority you can uh, appeal to even if you can prove it was fraudulent, you're just out of luck. And that makes the core system much simpler. Um, so that's that's one thing is I think that there are some reasons that to think that in the long run um, the architecture of Bitcoin will be – will require less regulation. Um, the, the other th thing to think about here is – and again, I think the, the analogy to the internet is important. Um, so if you think about a company like Google or Facebook, there are lots and lots of regulations that Google or Facebook need to comply with. There is you – know, in, in some European countries, you're not allowed to sell Nazi memorabilia and so Yahoo's auctions have to worry about that. Um, but the, those regulations apply to – specific companies. They don't reply to, apply to the internet as a whole. And in fact, we have, I think, wisely um, given companies that provide the core internet infrastructure uh, immunity. So uh, Verizon doesn't have to worry about selling Nazi memorabilia because that's seen as Yahoo's problem. Um, I think a similar thing is true of, of Bitcoin. So I think if you have um, the, the sort of Bank of America Bitcoin in the future, um, that entity will have to comply with lots of regulations in every company, country where it does business. Um, but the difference compared with the current system is that you will be able to that you'll be able to start new startups, and because the core Bitcoin protocol is open and no one controls it, you'll be able to immediately start doing business on that network um, without getting the approval of all the existing um, companies and existing regulators in a way that's not true. If if you want to start a new uh, conventional bank, um, you have to go to um, you basically have to get the other banks to recognize you as kind of a peer and that's a very difficult thing to have to, to do and they're going to throw all sorts of roadblocks in your way if you're threatening their business model. Um, with Bitcoin, because it's an open protocol like the internet, um, 
new companies can uh, kind of start up and in the same way that many internet companies kind of ignore, say, copyright rules for the first few years and, until they get big, new Bitcoin startups may be able to do the same thing. Well, let me ask it another way. Um, what if, say, some congressman decides that Bitcoin is a threat in some way to the US government? So mm -hmm. maybe like these if, – if people start making lots of transactions, buying and selling things, paying each other in Bitcoins. Um, it's hard to tax that. And the unregulated. I mean, you're, you're saying unregulated. I can hear a politician being like, "These transactions are unregulated and they're irreversible." Right. So, it, so he decides that this is a threat, mm -hmm. and gets a bunch of his congressman friends to agree, and they pass a law shutting down Bitcoin in some way. Is that possible? Mm -hmm. Is there a way that the government, if it really wanted to, could? Kind of stop this all dead in its tracks. So um, there, there's at least one senator, um, Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia, has in fact called for uh, I think the abolition of Bitcoin or you know uh, curtailment. Um, yeah, and it's theoretically possible. I mean, you could make it illegal to run the Bitcoin software on your computer, and that would probably mostly drive it out of the United States. Although not completely, there's you could go through there's various technical means you could be inside the United States but make it look like your connection was outside the United States. Um, but of course, this is a global network. So one of the strengths, I think, of Bitcoin is that um, y you just need a few countries where it's legal that um, can kind of co communicate with each other. And so you could certainly drive it underground in much the same way. I mean, so internet gambling seems like a good analogy here. Um, it's officially illegal in most circumstances in the United States and it's inconvenient for American consumers. But there are lots of gambling sites offshore. Any Americans that really want to gamble are probably going to be able to figure out how to do it. And um, in the long run, um, you're, you're not going to be able to I, – I think you're not going to be able to stop the Bitcoin network. Um, I, I, but also I think we're past that point. So we had um, – the first few years, my biggest concern was that you know, the politicians and regulators are going to decide that this is just a fundamentally too big of a threat to allow to exist and shut it down. Um, but we had a series of hearings. Um, two different committees in the Senate had hearings last fall and called the, the most senior Obama administration officials to testify. And it was basically completely positive. I mean they, they understand I think that fundamentally this is a new payment technology. Um, like any technology, any open technology, it has the uh, potential to be disruptive in much the same way the internet was disruptive. But also you know, if, if you um, shut down open technologies like that, you lose a lot of the potential for innovation. I mean, you, you can imagine 20 years ago if people said the, the internet is too big of a threat to our copyright laws or our um, you know, de defamation laws or something, the, what you would have lost from that is way larger than, than anything you would have gained. And I think people understand the same thing applies for Bitcoin. So if it's, if it's kind of uh, maybe stabilized a little bit on that level and then I, you said about Mt. Gox going, going, being a bad bank. Mm -hmm. and put in air quotes on that. Right. And there are still other ones that come up to offer better. So it's a highly competitive environment or like at least open access yeah. and you can supply these services. Uh, so it seems like that it could st st stabilize. The prices seem to stabilize around 500 to 600 going forward. Mm -hmm. um, and you said it's, it could be really volatile. Do you predict it will be stable going forward and, and the bad banks will go out of business? It's only three or four years old, right? Mt. Gox was originally a trading card website right. and it got into bitcoins. Uh, so, so, so yeah. So I mean I think those are two different questions. I, I think it's absolutely true that over time we'll see more sophisticated um, – Companies that have sort of grown ups managing, that have regular audits, that comply with the various laws, um, and that people will be able to have greater confidence. So, I mean, there's a there's a startup called Coinbase that's based in um, in the United States and that uh, is venture backed. And um, you know, I'm obviously I'm not going to say that there's no risk with them, but they're certainly a more reputable organization than Mt. Gox was or some of the, the other early startups. Um, and over time, I think you will see more and more regulatory scrutiny, I mean in some ways justifiably. I mean if, if you're holding people's money, you have an obligation to, to do that correctly. Um, but I think that's a separate question from whether the price will be volatile because the, the volatility is driven by supply and demand. And if Bitcoin succeeds, I think what you should expect to happen is that because the supply is, is fixed, um, if the volume of transactions goes up, the basic economics says that the, the value of the Bitcoins has to go up to accommodate that. Um, and so I, you know, I, I'm not going to predict what the price will be in 10 years, but I would not expect it to be between $500 and $600 or even $100 and $1,000. It could easily be $10,000. It could easily get down to $100. Um, and, and I think it just depends. It depends on how big this market is. I mean, I, th I think it makes more sense to, at this point to think about it a little bit more like a technology stock, right? You're, you're, it, there isn't a Bitcoin incorporated, but buying Bitcoins is a way of essentially buying into the long-term success of the Bitcoin network. And if the Bitcoin network becomes as big of a deal as the Bitcoin 
uh, supporters think it is, um, Bitcoins could be worth a lot more in the future. So is this a bubble? I mean, that's a lot of people have been saying. People are hoarding them. Maybe they're buying into it. And is it a bubble that's going to burst at some point? You know, I'm not, I'm not totally sure. I understand what what people mean when they say something is a bubble. I mean, obviously, it's a it's an asset whose value has been very volatile and it has gone up a lot over time. Um, but the question is, you know, so if you think about a company like Amazon.com, it had a quote unquote bubble in the 1990s and it went up to what seemed like an astronomical amount. If you look backwards, it's not actually unreasonable because the company actually proved to be worth that much. Um, there were lots of other companies that proved not to be worth that much. Um, so is it a bubble in the sense that a lot of kind of speculative action has pushed up the price? Sure. Um, is it an unjustified bubble where it's not? actually worth what people think it is? I don't know. I mean, that's something um, my guess is probably the current price is justified, but um, it's, there's a lot of uncertainty. We've been talking exclusively about Bitcoin so far, but Bitcoin's not the only cryptocurrency out there. And especially after Bitcoin came onto the scene, a whole bunch of other ones appeared. Mm -hmm. So are any of those other ones worth paying attention to? Are there ones that offer things that Bitcoin doesn't? Or has Bitcoin kind of taken over and it's going to be the one going forward if one of these things works? Yeah, so um, th there definitely are – there's I think probably 100 um, what's called altcoins, or cryptocurrencies that um, have non-trivial uh, user adoption. Um, but yeah, the thing is that the uh, – the value of all bitcoins in circulations is about eight billion dollars. Um, I think if you add up all the other ones put together, it's about one billion dollars. So um, Bitcoin is by far the most valuable, and this is just because of what economists call network effects. Like a, a network is valuable because other people use it. You know, the internet's valuable because other people are on it. Um, and as long as Bitcoin, as long as the Bitcoin community doesn't like royally screw up somehow and really like do something that destroys its value, um, there's going to be a strong advantage in being using the. the Technology everybody else is using, um, but that's that, what they thought about MySpace too. <laughs> they did think right. I mean, so right. So there's, yeah. So it's certainly possible that there will be a fatal flaw in the Bitcoin protocol, and it'll stumble, or the you know there's there's various ways that the network could sort of fall apart. In which case, I think you would see one of these alternatives. Um, so far, nobody has come up with a really. Um, I don't think anybody's come up with really fundamental improvements on the Bitcoin design. So there's um, the the leading uh, alternative to Bitcoin is a currency called Litecoin that um, processes transactions a little bit faster and um, uses a, um, a, a different the, – the mining thing, the mathematical problem you have to solve is different in a way that democratizes a little bit. So it's a little bit easier for people with normal PCs to, um, to do it. You know, if, if you were starting from scratch, I think both of those are probably good things and it would be better off for the world if Litecoin was the one everybody was using. But I don't think it's such a big advantage that people are going to jump away from Bitcoin and using Litecoin. I mean, what you've seen over time is that the relative prices of these currencies have been pretty stable. So um, you know, Bitcoin is worth, uh, I don't know, like 10 or 20 times what Litecoin is. And that was true a year ago and I think it'll be true um, probably in, in a year. And so probably they'll all grow. But Bitcoin is so much larger that for practical purposes, it's still, I think, the only one that matters. Trevor Well, it seems like the really fascinating thing about that is, is that it reminds us about competitive currencies in general in a way that we haven't been reminded because there, we didn't have – we didn't print money in the United States until the 1860s and there were tons of possible currencies out there you could use mm -hmm. and there were ones that were – that would outcompete ones compared to other ones and those are the ones that had more people using them that had their own preferred – networking effects to them. So we're seeing mm -hmm. that again. Yeah, although one difference I think is that those currencies were still mostly pegged to the dollar. I mean, they, they were effectively all versions they're all pegged to gold ultimately. Right? All pegged to some sort of like some sort of metal usually, but but right. they're also there's also commodity currencies trading in tobacco, trading mm -hmm. in tea, trading in wampum. Yes, uh, all, yeah, all so, these types of things. So I don't know very much about the history, but yes, I think that's um, certainly it's something that wasn't true before, you know, in the last few decades. And now we're seeing and, it. Yeah. And now we're seeing it again. Yeah, and I, th I think that um, it, it's interesting. I, mean, I do think that the um, – in some ways that's a disadvantage of Bitcoin. I, mean, I don't think we want to oversell. Like it's interesting that it's an alternative currency. Um, but I think most people don't they're, – they're perfectly happy with the fact that dollar is a dollar and everybody accepts the same unit of currency. I don't think it would be a good thing for the world if we had 10 alt currencies mm -hmm. that each had 10 percent market share and you had to like make all these computations in your head if you wanted to convert from one to the other. Trevor Burrus There's an old uh, uh, monetary theory game you can play with networking effects to try and graph how different competing currencies will win out and, mm -hmm. and the way you would play it is you take some jelly beans mm 
and you have a bunch of them in a jar, maybe a hundred multicolored jelly beans in a jar, and then each player in a in a row of like twenty has also their own jelly beans, and they reach in and they take out one that has like a red one, mm-hmm. and they and then they match it with a red one of their own and they put it back in, and then they pass it on to the next person. And they and they've just micro increased the chances of that person getting a red one when they uh-huh. get it. And so each person does that, and you can graph the colors as they go, mm-hmm. and and you'll see one start to win out red, and then it will go down, and then it will be blue, and then maybe at the end, bl- blue will take over half the jar, right. which will which is how co- currencies emerge. So we might watch that happen with bitcoins. Yeah, I, th- I think in the long run there will almost certainly be one global cryptocurrency, probably Bitcoin. But if you could have some kind of disaster that let somebody else um, take the lead. Um, but yeah, I think in the long run, the network effects are very strong. I mean, it's the same reason there's only one internet. There's not 10 different internet pro- networking protocols that kind of compete. Um, once people sort of settle on TCP IP as the one, it's what everybody switched to. I think probably something similar will happen with, with currencies. So what can uh, uh, I guess two questions. What can um, people in general learn from Bitcoin? Uh, and what we're seeing happening here. I mean, we've talked about some of them, but and, and also, what should libertarians? Uh, what can libertarians learn from this? Well, so I think one of the one of the interesting things about Bitcoin. I mean, it's it's, it's a young technology still, but I think it's a it underscores the the lesson that um, that technologies that are not controlled by anybody um, have a lot of advantages for both for innovation. One of the other things we haven't talked about is the um, kind of anti-censorship properties of Bitcoin. Um, so the, the organization WikiLeaks um, has, is not in the favor of the US government and uh, US politicians uh, when uh, they were sort of in the spotlight in 2010 um, were uh, – used their sort of leverage over traditional credit card networks to basically starve WikiLeaks of funds. Um, that would be much harder to do for an open technology with Bitcoin. And just as the internet uh, is a pretty effective way at um, helping people in, in you know, repressive regimes get access to information, um, I think Bitcoin can be a way you – know, if you're an Iranian dissident and you want to buy space to host a blog outside of Iran, um, it's, it'll probably be easier to get your hands on some Bitcoins and pay that way than it will be to pay um, with, with credit cards. Um, so I think that's one of the, the big lessons is that um, – any sort of centralized technology is a centralized point of control, um, which can lead to um, various it can limit freedom in various ways. But liberty disrupts patterns, and people find a way around it. I think that's true. Yes. Well, thank you, Tim, for coming on Free Thoughts today. Thanks. It's been a pleasure. And if if anyone in our audience is, wants to follow up with you, is really interested in this, and has questions or whatever, where can they find you online? Um, so I am at Binary Bits on Twitter. Um, so you can certainly uh, follow me there and um, send me messages there. Um, and I write for uh, Vox.com, which uh, at least when we're recording this has not launched, but it will, will in the next um, few weeks. Um, that's just vox.com. Thank you for listening to Free Thoughts. If you have any questions or comments about today's show, you can find us on Twitter at Free Thoughts Pod. That's Free Thoughts P O D. Free Thoughts is a project of Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute and is produced by Evan Banks. To learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.